you're the exact fit. Ah. He's so comfortable in you. Yeah. It is so wonderful to have a reference that is the same yesterday and today and forever. God is not in the process of making up his mind about the human race. Jesus Christ declares that God has made up his mind about you. So a reference is not in the balance. A reference is not something where we're trying to put pressure on God, hopefully, to influence Him to become favorable towards us. We read scriptures like in Romans 8, if God before us, we think the if is perhaps a question mark. I'm so glad that Jesus made every crooked place straight. <laughs> the if can never again be a condition. It is an almighty conclusion. God is for us. Emmanuel, God declared for all time that He embraced the human race in one man, in one person. And he has made us welcome there. We belong in there. We belong in God's moment. God's moment carries so much more than just a, another little slot in our busy schedule. Our lives become his moment. I mean, if Aratus was a Greek philosopher, if you could stumble onto seeing that in God we live and move and have our being. If Aratus could say this 300 BC, how can we in any other context interpret Emmanuel? Is our breath, is our moment, is our future. We are indeed his offspring. Man began in God. He imagined you. The thought of you thrills God. You are the greatest idea that God had ever had. Can you see how odd it would be for us to try and try and define God, inventing with our theology and our doctrine? When he has come to give himself such visible, articulate definition in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not arrive 2011 years ago to start the Christian calendar. <laughs> I thank God for the Christian calendar. At least we've got some reference to the, our date of birth. But there's a greater birth that he came to reveal. When he was revealed in the flesh, born of the womb of a woman, he declared that mankind began in God. That we are Anuthen, says the Greek, from above. That He knew us before He formed us in our mother's womb. Before He wrote your DNA script, He knew you. You are no surprise to your Maker. And because of His knowledge of you, he declared your original worth by sending Jesus as the Lamb of God to redeem our original innocence, our original identity, our original value, redeemed. So our point of departure in our fellowship, our koinonia, is not for us to try and invent some kind of program, some kind of ritual again. Building another little shrine to the unknown God. Hopefully we'll, we'll you know, sing enough songs so that we can eventually get some feedback. <laughs> but we discovered that we need song all along. <laughs> Jesus is God's music. Yeah. You're His poetry. Yeah. <laughs> he wrote you. David says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. To imagine that God knew my unformed substance. When I was knitted together in my mother's womb. Your life is so precious to your father. Human life cannot be traded with. There is no silver, no gold, no currency that can buy one human life. We are redeemed by the priceless blood of the Lamb of God. 
If God said anything in the cross, He said enough to redeem our original worth. He did not die out of pity for the human race. He sold all that He had because He knew that there was more to the agricultural field than what met the eye. He knew there was a treasure in the earthen vessel. And He's come to redeem the treasure. When that body was broken on that cross, God cancelled every possible ground for any accusation against His creation. Jesus proved that God did not make a mistake when He made you. He redeemed you. You are redeemed. God was in Christ. When He did what? When He reconciled the world to Himself. The word reconciled in the Greek is the word katalastro. It means a transaction where equal value is exchanged. He sold all that He had when He redeemed the field. Whose field was it then? It was His. <laughs> to begin with. My mother told the story when we were little about this little boy who um, carved a beautiful little boat out of wood and he engraved his name on this little boat and he painted it. This was his dream and he made a little mast and a little sail and how he would play with this boat and live his imagination with his little creation and one day the little stream was in flood and he lost his boat. And then some weeks later, he was walking through the town and in the toy shop, in the window, he saw his own little boat. He ran in and he tried to convince the shopkeeper, he says, that is my boat. I made it, that's my name. The shopkeeper says, well, if you want it back, you'll have to buy it back. So he did. He went and worked <laughs> for weeks. And when he bought the boat, and when he held it to his chest, he says, now you are double mine. Oh, I made you. And I redeemed you. Oh, you are double mine. He came to his own, even though his own did not roll out the red carpet. He was born in a stable, no place found for him in the inn. Didn't change God's mind. <laughs> I'm so glad that God's not moody and he's not sulky. You say sulky, he's not in a pity party mode. He says, all day long I stretched out my hands towards a disobedient country people. But your indifference did not change my mind. I was ready to be found before you sought me. I said, here I am. The gospel celebrates the initiative of God. He loved us first. He beat us to it. And he did not love us as a reward for good behavior. Our indifference, our hostility did not change his mind. He only always loved us. And in His Son He embraced us. So that we may discover how we have always been known. I mean, if He knew us before He formed us in our mother's womb, we were no surprise to Him. Even though we might have been a great surprise to our parents, He knew us. And what He knew about us, He redeemed to persuade us. We are already the heirs of the promise. And every someone who already enjoys a legal relationship, a legal standing as far as the promise is concerned. But what is the promise worth if it's not embraced? So He came in Christ. And Hebrews 6 says He swore by Himself, having no greater authority by whom he could swear. Not to persuade him, to persuade us. 
Faith is not our ability to get ourselves to think positive enough so we think, finally I have accessed faith. Faith is God's persuasion embracing us in the gospel. The good news is God's persuasion about you. God is persuaded about you. And He cannot say it louder than what He did in His Son. In Sonship, God says, I am your only true Father. You have no other parent but me. Jesus goes so far as to say in Matthew 3, 23, verse 9, He says, Call no man your father. He's not being rude. I mean, we honor our parents. They had the pleasure to conceive us and perhaps the pleasure even to raise us. But our true parent is our father. There is only one father of the human race. And Jesus, not Adam, Jesus is the head of the human race. Because He came to reveal and to redeem the image of the invisible God in human form. Not in a 50 feet tall angelic body, but in human form. He has come to redeem the original space that God always had in mind to be His dwelling place. You are His tabernacle. You are God's address. He is so at home in you. Taylor made it for the Almighty. The fullness of deity that the heavens cannot measure. The fullness of deity dwells in Christ Jesus in a human body. I'm so glad Jesus didn't come for a brief visit of 33 years. When the disciples started feeling nervous because he was talking about dying and going on wedding. He said, I will not leave you orphans. He the only reason I'm going to this cross. He said that this world can be embraced again. To be where I am. Where are you then, Jesus? I'm in the bosom of the Father. That's where you belong. In the embrace of the Father. Wide open space. Nothing between us. No hint of a sin consciousness. Isn't it wonderful to find the dancing father? I was in Washington, was it last week, Lydia? And uh, I've preached Deuteronomy 32, 18 for many years. And for the first time I saw a lovely Hebrew word in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 32. Moses sings the song, remember, begins with this beautiful introduction. He says, I want the whole heavens and all the earth to be my audience. He says, I want to declare the name of the Lord. It's like Moses says, I, I want to introduce the living God again to planet earth. And I want the heavens to be my witness. He says, let my teaching dispense the view upon the tender grass. And a shower was upon the strong earth. He says, ascribe greatness to our God, the rock. His work is perfect. You see, the greatness of God can only be measured. By his perfect work. If Van Gogh could find a moment to sign his name and put down the brush, that even Van Gogh could not add another stroke to the canvas, what else could ever define God's Sabbath? He rests not because he's exhausted, but because he celebrates his workmanship. Yeah. Ephesians 2 10 says, You are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. If you be damned in him, he is the author and the finisher of faith. There is only one faith that matters. Not what man believes about him, but what he believes about us. He has us on record. Tattooed in his hands. He has come to declare us. Ascribe greatness to our God. The rock. His work. Is perfect. Now in verse 18 of Deuteronomy 32, Moses says, But you have forgotten the rock that begot you. You see, in the language of the Old Testament, it was BC, BC days. 
before BC days, so there was no hard drive, but there was rock. <laughs> you know that fossils did not become fossils because we discovered them. They've been fossils for a while. <laughs> there is a testimony in stone. Do you want to say something to the next generation in those days? You'd better just let in stone. You've forgotten your reference. Our lives through Adam's fall became reduced to the flesh. When we've lost consciousness of our original blueprint, the image, the likeness of God revealed in human form. He says, you've forgotten the rock. We got you. And the Hebrew continues, he says, and the God who danced with you. Can you see yourself in his arms? This is what Jesus restored. He didn't come to start a new political party called the Christian Party. He didn't come to win a few votes for Christianity. He came to declare to humanity their father. Is there anything you know about God that is unlike me? He's not God. Jesus did not come to change God's mind about man. You see, all our pagan religious ideas, we've invented this angry God who cannot wait to get us back. And you're dealing with this moody temperament. And he's got all these anger management problems. So every now and again he has to beat us up with another tsunami and with AIDS and with cancer. He didn't come to change his father's mind of man. He came to change man's mind about the father. He says, you've seen me. You've seen the father. The Pharisees felt rather reluctant to embrace Jesus' idea of the father. They could not quite get to why would Jesus spend so much dear time I mean, if he only has three years in ministry, why would he waste so much time with the wrong, with the wrong crowd? It's like he's hanging out with the most labeled sinners in society. I mean, here we are. We're the religious leaders of the day. We thought we had to invite Jesus into our lives. We thought we had to invite the Holy Spirit into our fellowship. You see, we do not invent fellowship. We are invited into the fellowship of the Father and the Son. We are invited into the fellowship of the Father and the Son. Jesus, why would you mix with the wrong crowd? Because they're the right crowd. He says, I came to seek and to save the lost. What does the word lost mean? It means there is ownership involved. If Psalm 24 verse 1 is right, then the earth is indeed the Lord's and not the devil's. The earth is not divided into religious or political or geographic boundaries. Planet earth belongs to the maker of the heavens and the earth. If God sold all that he had to redeem his interest on this planet, then what this planet holds in terms of those who dwell in it is the inheritance of God. He says, today, I have begotten you. Remember Paul preaches this in Acts chapter 13 and he's quoting as his text verse, Psalm 2. Today, I have begotten you. But what is Paul preaching? He's preaching the resurrection from the dead. I mean, even Peter gets the message. He starts writing, remember he was an illiterate fisherman, but he starts writing 30 years later after Jesus ascended. And his opening statement, 1 Peter 1 verse 3 is, we were born anew into a living hope. Not into a delaying expectation. A living hope. How did that happen, Peter? Through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Today, I have begotten you. 
And every Duke wrote the rest of that song just like that. They just needed one line. Ask of me the nations, and I will give you the ends of the earth as your inheritance. The ends of the earth? Is that not perhaps rather bold, God? I mean, we, the ends of the earth? Your inheritance? We thought you're sitting nervously with your thumb on the red button to blow us into swimmerings. Not if Jesus took the judgment of this world upon himself. In John chapter 12, Jesus says now. Have you noticed how often Jesus says now? Yeah. Hebrews 11 verse 1 also says now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now if you've got substance and evidence to work with, what more do we need? Jesus is the substance. He is the evidence of every expectation that the human race could ever have. Christ in you completes your expectation. Nothing more. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Him. And you are in Him by God's doing. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30. By His doing. He says, before the foundation of the earth, I associated you in Christ. The pin code of the book. Those two words, in Christ. 1 John 5, 20 says, we know that the Son of God has come. He says, we're not debating that part of our message. We know that, at least we are still celebrating 2011. So we know that 2011 is something bigger than FIFA happened to planet Earth. I mean, we're still in the FIFA mode in South Africa because we had FIFA 2010, the wonderful World Cup, first time in Africa. But 2011 years ago, something happened on planet Earth that establishes the fact that the Son of God has come. What was His mission then? To give us understanding. Because we have forgotten what manner of man we are. We have forgotten the rock that gave birth to us, the God that danced to us. He has come to play His flute again, so that we can dance with Him. Such a wonderful tour. <laughs> Lydia and I are just so often totally overwhelmed and in tears. Celebrating six weeks in the years of life. We have been so enormously blessed. From the East Coast to the West Coast. <laughs> and the Texas and the Memphis in between and the Washington. <laughs> I was still in 1 John 5 verse 20, that it reminds me. We know that the Son of God has come. What was His mission? To give us understanding. To know Him who is true. Not to try and chisel out of stone or wood our latest idea, our newest doctrine, our latest interpretation. But to know Him who is true. Wasn't it John? The disciple who, who had his head on Jesus' chest, who wrote such beautiful things, he says, this is eternal life, it's to know him. And then 1 John 5, 20 says, it's so beautiful, he says, and this is the truth. We are in him who is true. How did we get there? <laughs> Of God are you in Christ, whom God made to be your wisdom. Wisdom has found its only valid reference. No, no, not in man's doctrine, not in man's experience, but in the wisdom that comes from above, who reveals how righteous we are, how holy we are, because of redemption. 
You see, in redemption, God redeemed His original design in man. So that in the gospel, we may now find glad tidings of great joy. Because in the announcement of the gospel, we discovered the face of our birth. We were born anew. The rock that begot us birthed us again out of that rock hewn tomb where he was laid. And when the stone was rolled away, we were born anew through his resurrection. You see, the gospel is so powerful because it's so simple. Yeah. Paul cannot make it easier for us than what he does in 2 Corinthians 5 14. He says, The love of Christ constrains me. He says, You want to discover the reason, the motivation behind my ministry. No, it's not my job career that motivates me. I'm not a pastor because I'm struggling selling my tents. He says, I'm driven because the love of Christ resonates within me. Because I've made this calculation that if one died for all, then all have died. And if they died in God's belief, then we might as well agree with God. If that's what God believes, it might not be popular theology. Popular theology might want to say rather something like, um, Well, we believe that one died for all. Therefore, all those who joined my group will one day qualify to erect themselves also to have died. No, no, no. God's much simpler than that. He says, One, all. Therefore, all. I was preaching in Swap of Men the other day. I was a little two year old sitting in the dust with her back towards me, playing. And I said, you know, it's like one plus one. She shouts, it is true! <laughs> so we called that message, one plus one equals two. <laughs> if a two-year-old child can say that, when she was three years old maybe. But it's still two. It doesn't become two by popular vote. You see, truth does not become true. Truth is not something fragile that needs at least a majority vote. <coughs> truth is already true. Long before there was a show of hands. God made the calculation. None of the rulers of this world had a clue. If they did, they would never have crucified the Lord of glory. Whose glory? His glory in us. He led us as trophies on high, having descended into the deepest pits of hell. He led us out as trophies on high. What did He redeem? His own? And you see how nervous the Pharisees got when, when Jesus told them, those three parables in Luke 15. I mean, if it wasn't enough to talk about the, the hundred sheep, and not 50% lost, one lost. One lost. And the shepherd goes and lays his life down to find one. The ten coins, one lost. Then it repeats exactly the same gospel to the two boys. Same home, same family. One lost. If these two boys represent the Gentiles and the Jews, then God has a beautiful message to the other brother. This is my son. You have been with me always. And all that I have is yours. Pleading. Pleading with the other son to join the party. Can you imagine the father dancing with the prodigal son? Can you imagine the bliss, the joy, the embrace, 
the festivity. <laughs> because he was dead and behold he lives. Was there a hint of regret? A hint of suspicion? Or a frown on the father's forehead? I mean that one chapter is enough to rewrite theology. We kind of thought the father was more like the other brother. <laughs> but he keeps no record. Because every possible record of humanity's transgression was cancelled. And one day, when the blood of the Lamb took away the sins of this world, when the document of humanity's guilt was cancelled on the cross, God did not put sin on hold. We'll deal with it later. He dealt with it. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. God says, of your sins and your iniquities, I will think no more. There is not a thought in God's capacity to remind him of sin. Amen. 